I'm Jan Stevenson, and thanks for joining me. You know, anybody can really enjoy golf, whether your style is power or finesse and accuracy. So today, we're going to use these and other principles to sharpen your game. We'll be working with three women, Jane Higginson, Jill Devine, and Hisako Mura. Their styles and levels of play vary, which gives us a good opportunity to improve their game as well as yours. As we move through each phase of this videotape, the segment titles are written on the screen, and a different color background appears. This way, later when you want to work on a specific area or brush up, which believe me is often, just fast forward or push the search button to locate the appropriate segment and corresponding color. There are seven segments covered. The color codes for each section are as follows. First, club selection will be white. Second, warm up will be yellow. Third, the tee shot will be green. Fourth, the fairway shot will be turquoise. Fifth, the hazards will be red. Sixth, pitching and chipping will be lilac. And seventh, putting will be pink. Like any sport, you want proper equipment. So we'll start by selecting clubs that are comfortable and the right ball. Then we'll warm up before tackling that first tee. Work on your grip, stance, and swing. Plus cover which clubs to use off the tee. And then, depending on where you land in the fairway, you'll learn to handle the middle woods and irons. And just when you think you can't hit a bad shot, up jumps the devil. The hazards, bunkers, water, the rough, and sand traps. These I know well. Then we'll cover the short irons for pitching and chipping. And finally, putting. This is where you can really shave strokes off your game. Club selection. Decisions, decisions. Whether you go to a pro shop at a golf course or a sporting goods store, you'll find excellent equipment tailored to your game. Here are some tips on club selection. When having your clubs measured for your true custom fit, be sure you're measured from your fingertips to the ground and not according to your height. For men, swing weight should be somewhere around D0, and for women, somewhere between C2 and C6. A man six foot tall should have a standard lion loft, and a woman, let's say five foot five, should have about a two degrees flat and a standard loft. Another important consideration in determining the selection of equipment is choosing the right grip size. If a woman wears a ladies' large golf club, she needs her grip size to be one thirty-second oversized standard women's. With a regular glove, a regular grip, and with a small glove, one thirty-second undersized women's standard. Men, on the other hand, with a small men's golf club, will need one thirty-second undersized men's standard. A medium golf glove will take a medium grip, and a large glove will take a one thirty-second oversized grip. Before you go shopping for your clubs, you might want to jot down some notes from this tape so that you can ask the right questions. Here's another tip. The right ball makes a big difference, too. There are two types of balls. One is a two-piece blend, and the other is a soft-wound ballata ball. The two-piece ball is popular with amateurs because it's hard to cut and it runs a lot more. The ballata ball is softer and easier to spin, but it's also easier to cut. This type is more popular with the professionals. Well, that's it. Keep in mind that your equipment choices should be tailored to your specific needs. And don't hesitate to ask your local golf pro or an experienced golfer to help you select the right equipment. The warm-up. Warming up on the driving range, a very important part of the game, and it's very overlooked. You know, you wouldn't ever go play any kind of exercise or sport and not warm up, and yet I see it in golf all the time. I play with so many people that arrive five minutes before our tee time and play nine holes and say, you know, it takes me nine holes to warm up. All it takes is ten minutes, and it can make all the difference in the world, not just in your game, but so that there are no injuries. You're out there for five hours, and it takes ten minutes to warm up those muscles. Now, the way to do it, there's a certain little method, and it's really quite easy. I start with the pitching wedge. I, I don't hit a full shot. I hit a little kind of three-quarter shot, go down the shaft, just to get comfortable with my grip, my stance, kind of get to know my clubs again. I make a small swing, and from there I go to like a nine iron. And I'll take a nine iron and go nine iron, seven iron, five iron, three iron. And maybe tomorrow I'll go eight, six, and four. Because sometimes you get into the habit of playing with a favorite club. So make sure that you don't practice with the same clubs all the time. And also, this is not practice, it's warm up. If you want to work on your swing, do it after you've played or after you've warmed up. Don't worry where the ball goes. That way, I hear people say all the time, I left all my best shots on the driving range. 
That's not what you're doing. You're warming up. You shouldn't even really be paying any attention to where the ball's going. You're just loosening up your muscles. In fact, I don't even take a full swing till I get into my long irons. If you want to stretch out your muscles, take it a little bit slow. Start with a nine iron, work your way up. And then when you get your long irons, then start making a good shoulder turn. You don't want to injure anything. It's very important in golf. You know, your back gets torqued in one direction so much that you want to be very careful that you don't hurt it. Now, when you do get to your woods and your driver, just make sure you stretch out your upper arms and your back just a little bit. In fact, you'll see a lot, lots of times on the first tee, the professionals are always kind of stretching with their back with their driver. You know, you can let it go just a little bit in the back where your shoulder cuffs are. Make sure that you stretch it just a little bit. Makes all the difference in the world. The other thing is don't go to the driving range before you play and start with your driver. Always finish with your driver and then go to the first tee. In fact, if you putt after you've hit balls before you go to the first tee, you'll stiffen up worse than even if you hadn't have warmed up. So putt first, then loosen up with your wedge and always go from the, from the driving range to the first tee. If you're gonna hit off with a driver in the first tee, finish with a driver. If you're gonna tee off on the first tee with a three wood, finish with a three wood. You'd be surprised the difference this makes to your golf game. Now I'm gonna finish with the driver and then go to the first tee. I have one little secret. I only hit three or four drivers on the driving range before I go, but I always like to finish on a good one. So let's hope this is it. That way I have a good positive thought going to that first tee. You'd be surprised the difference it makes. The tee shot. Finesse is the key to your golf game. Oh sure, it's a great feeling to bust one every now and then, but that takes quite a lot of power to master and a lot of slices, shanks and lost balls in between. What we're looking for is sound fundamentals and consistency. The rest will fall into place. Hitting a golf ball correctly takes a number of physical elements working together to build your own personal rhythm and tempo. And it starts with finding the right spot on the tee. And make sure it's a flat area. Now that we're on the tee, let's go ahead with our basic fundamentals and talk about the grip. There are three different kind of grips. The baseball grip, which is pretty obvious. It's just two hands, just like you would with the baseball. And that really isn't incorrect, but it's not very popular. Then there's what's called the interlocking grip, and that is when you interlocked your right little finger with your left forefinger. The interlocking grip doesn't serve any real purpose, except it does help the hands work as one. Again, this doesn't really do anything, but the most important and the most orthodox is what's called the Vaden grip. And this is the one that I have and 99% of professionals have. And what it is, is you're going to take the pad of your left hand is going to sit right there on the butt of the grip and it will go across the knuckle of your left forefinger. So when you close it, there is formed a V between your thumb and your forefinger. And this line should point somewhere between your right shoulder and your chin. Now your right hand, there's a little indentation in your right hand. That sits right on top of your left thumb. Now you hold it more with your thumb and your right forefinger for two reasons. You hear a lot of people say you want to keep your golf grip in one piece. So I hold on with the three fingers of the last three fingers of my left hand and these two of my right hand. And what that does, it makes them hold as one because you only have two fingers of your right hand and three of your left. The other reason is when you get to the top of your backswing, if you're holding on with these three fingers, you can let these two go and you can still keep that position. Holding on here eliminates a common problem of what's called re-gripping on the way down. And you can hold on with these and let these go and you can still have a good shot. Now a lot of people have a death grip with these fingers and that's incorrect because you can waver at the top of your swing. So make sure that you hold on with these three fingers of your left hand. And again, at the top of your swing, make sure you're holding on with these two fingers of your right hand because this can keep it on line. If you don't get on top here and hold on with these two, it is going to go laid off or across the line. So make sure you hold on with these two fingers of your right hand and the last three of your left. And that's the only thing to it. Again, there's a V formed with your right hand. And again, this should be parallel to your left. If you open your left hand and open your right hand, they will be parallel. 
So make sure you check all of these points. And again, that V should point somewhere between your right shoulder and your chin. Now that's what's called a strong grip. And more and more people, even men pros, are getting more and more of a strong grip, which means that everything points more to the right shoulder. It's a much more powerful position. It gets your wrists in a position where they can release much easier and, of course, create that power that we're all looking for. So let's go ahead and check those basic fundamentals again. Always hold on with the last three fingers of your left hand. Make sure that the V is pointing somewhere between your right shoulder and your chin. Again, hold this indentation over your left thumb. Close it down and hold on with your thumb and your right forefinger. Keep hold of those two, and it all should form as one. Make sure the top of your swing, when you go back, that you're holding on with the last three fingers and the first two of your right hand. That's all there is to it. Now that we have the grip, let's go to alignment. If you can't line up correctly, then you can't hit the ball straight. I try to keep my feet together because I see so many amateurs walk into the ball and set up by looking at where they want to hit it first. And then they set their club. And when you do this, it automatically sets your body in a position that's comfortable but really isn't lined up correctly. So the way that a lot of professionals do it and the way that I do it is I, I get my feet pretty much together. And then I set my club first. That way my body isn't overtaking where I want it to line up. Now I set my club, I have a line on my club, and I point that right through where I want the ball to go. Now I create, after that, an imaginary line through that ball, all the way to my target. Now from there, all I do is widen my stance, set my hips and my shoulders parallel to that line. Now that's the most important thing. People think that your feet, your hips, and your shoulders should point to your target, which would mean that instead of being parallel to that imaginary line, they would be aimed right, which is what is called closed, and that would create the ball to have a right to left spin on the ball. So make sure that there's a parallel line through your ball and that your feet hips and shoulders are parallel to that line that you want your ball to go. So in actual fact, if you stood behind my feet, if you laid a club across my feet, it should be actually left of my target because it is slightly left of that parallel line. There's two parallel lines drawn straight to your target. Now another way you'll see a lot of professionals when they're up on the practice tee is they set a club like I have over here because there's another parallel line and they try to make their body and the line that's going from the ball all in a parallel line. So that's all you do and that's how you can check it. You can set a club down there to make sure that again the line that you want the ball to go on is going to be parallel to that club. And your feet, your hips, and your shoulders will also be parallel. So they'll be slightly aimed a little left. And that's all there is to that too. Let's check our ball position. Remember in alignment you should set your club first. Then widen your stance, and everything should be parallel. Now, to get the correct ball position, this parallel line creates a perpendicular line, and it should be two inches on the inside of your left heel. And it should stay uniformly this through every shot. Some people think that it should change all the time, and it shouldn't. The only thing that changes is the width of your stance. Now, remember that. That's very important. Keep the same ball position two inches on the inside of your left heel. Now to get comfortable with your body in addressing the ball, people think that they should bend from the waist. That's incorrect. The way to get comfortable, widen your stance, feel like you're sitting on a tall stool, bend your knees. Now your knees must be bent because like in everything, skiing or in golf, they must act as shock absorbers for your swing. So make sure that they're bent comfortably. You're sitting on a tall stool. Now you do not bend from the waist. You bend from the hips. And you create a straight line with your back. Now all of this can be checked. Make sure, again, your ball position, it's two inches on the inside of your left heel with a perpendicular line through the ball. Your knees are comfortably bent, your back is straight, and you're bending from the hips. That's all there is to that. Let's cover the short details of the backswing. Very important part of the swing is it's a wind up where you're gonna create all of your power. I try to think of several things. One, the first 12 inches I take it back on a straight line 
and then all I do from there is turn my shoulders. At the top of my backswing, my back should be facing the target. And always check that. You want to make sure that you've made a big shoulder turn. The other thing to watch is that you should have 95% of your weight on your right foot. Now, most amateurs do it the other way. At the top of their backswing, 95% of their weight is on their left side, which is what's called a reverse weight shift. So the way to check that, when you take it back on your backswing, you should be able to take it back and actually lift your right left foot off the ground. There should only be 5% to keep your balance right there. So I can actually take it back, lift my left foot off the ground and still hit it. Once you have yourself set up at the backswing, all you have to do from here is key your downswing and follow through. I have people ask me all the time, what do you think of on your downswing? It is less than half a second from the top of your backswing to you hit impact, so there's nothing that you can really think of. So what I try to do is, is get it started on the right track. I try to get, now that my weight is 95% on my right side, get my weight as quickly as I can from my right side to my left side. So I try to feel like my right knee touches my left knee as quickly as possible. What that does, it causes a fulcrum effect. The bottom half of my body goes ahead. My upper half will stay behind the ball. From there, all I do is move my weight through and follow through. At the very top of your backswing, follow through, your weight should be all on the outside of your left heel, and the right foot sh toe should be just on the ground for balance. Again, 95% of your weight should be on your left side. In fact, if you wanted to check that, you'll see people like Gary Player use their weight so well, their lower half of the body, that when they create power, they actually walk forwards. It's okay as long as you don't walk backwards. If you walk forwards, then your weight's going the right direction. A lot of amateurs have the problem with the reverse weight shift as they get their weight to the left side and the way back, and they fall backwards on the way through. And that's very powerless from there. So make sure, again, your weight gets onto the top of your backswing on your right side, and as you follow through, it's all the way over onto the outside of your left side. Let's go over the important things one more time. Set your club first. Set your feet, hips and shoulders parallel to the line that you want the ball to go. Take it straight back the first 12 inches. Then begin a wrist cock at waist high. Take a full shoulder turn, making sure your back is to the target. At the top of the backswing, your weight should be mostly on your right side. Now key your downswing by pushing off with your right foot onto the left side. Hold your follow through and make sure that all your weight is on the left side. Okay, now let's see Jill hit one. Good shot. Well, Jill, you're doing a lot of things right. Your grip is very good and you've got a good weight transfer on the way back. Two things though. One, I want you to try to keep your left arm straight on your way back. The reason that this does, it, gets, it creates a huge arc. The further you can get this club head away from the ball, the more power you're going to get. Okay. And the second thing is, don't keep your head down. You, I always thought that I was supposed to keep my head down. <laughs> I know, I hear that all the time and that's wrong. <laughs> you really shouldn't keep your head down because if you follow through correctly, your head should follow through just like okay. it says. So I want you to hold your follow through and let's see if it's better. Okay. And try to keep your left arm straight on the way back. Okay. Jill's left arm is a little straighter but it needs to be even more so. Take a look at mine. Jill still has a tendency to keep her head down and that hinders her weight transfer. Watch in my follow through how my head has moved because of my weight transfer. Okay, now it's Jane's turn. Okay, I want you to set up again like you're going to hit the ball. Okay. Now remember I said that you should only have a hand's width between your hands and your body, so uh -huh. I want you to keep your hands there comfortably. Okay, sh I should move forward then too. Yeah. yeah, bend your uh -huh. knees, bend uh -huh. comfortably, and then keep your hands about a hand's width. Okay. The other thing is that you're standing a little bit too steady on your feet. You've got them bent well, uh -huh. but there's no weight transfer. I see. So what I want you to do is try to move your weight from your right side and your right knee point towards your left knee. Your left oh, knee point, yes, okay. and then on the way through, your right knee point towards your left knee. Okay. Good, you get a weight transfer and get some power. Okay. Jane breaks her hands too quickly on her takeaway, whereas mine is long and low. Her left knee points to the ball instead of to her right side, as mine is. At the top of her swing, there is not enough shoulder turn. The back should be to the target, as mine is. On the way down, she keeps her weight too much on her right side, whereas mine is all the way over onto my left heel. Now let's check out what we've learned. This is a handy section of the tape to come back to often just to check your fundamentals.
away shot. Fairway shots. This part of the game is probably the hardest for amateurs because they never take enough club. They always allow for the perfect hit. And even the professionals don't do that. I always take a little bit extra and swing smooth because I want to be putting for my birdie, not chipping. Remember, a green is about 30 yards long, which is about three clubs. Once you determine how far you can hit a club, let's take a five iron for instance. I hit a five iron about 155 yards. Then just add or subtract 10 yards per club, a four iron, 165, and a six iron, 145, and so on. Instead of allowing to hit the perfect shot to the middle of the green, try to play to the back of the green. It's very difficult to hit the ball over the green, and you're always giving yourself plenty of room for error so that you can be putting for your birdie. The other thing with second shots, sometimes you get a bad lie. On the tee, you know exactly what kind of lie you're going to have, but over here, you're rolling the dice. I have just rolled into a divot, so how do I get out of it? The worst thing you do when you're in a divot is try to help it out. Always do the opposite. I'm in a divot, so I make another divot. I want the ball to go high, I go down on the ball. So what I'm going to do with this one, I'm in a bad lie. Everything else is the same, the setup, the grip. All I'm going to do is play, t take plenty of club, make sure I have plenty of club to get to the green, swing smooth, hit the ball first, and hit down on the ball. Don't try to pick it out of the bad lie. And it comes out just the same as the good lie. When you find yourself in the situation where your ball is buried in long grass in the rough, there are several things you should change in your swing. Normally with a normal golf swing, you would take it back long and low. And in doing this, coming back to the ball, you'd mat a lot of long grass between the club and the ball, which would turn the club face shut, and the ball would come out heavy, low, and left. To eliminate that, you take the club, which is square, and you open the club face. You regrip. You take your stance. You aim left or open. Now, the secret from here is to break your hands very sharply away from the ball. And what that does is it's going to create a sharp angle of attack between the club head and the ball, eliminating all that long grass. So again, break your hands very quickly and aim a touch left. And the ball will come out high and straight. With the long iron out of grass such as this, a tough shot. You can hit the three iron the same way as I've explained with the shorter iron. People ask me all the time, how far away should I stand for a long iron? It's exactly the same with every club. The club dictates how far away you stand with the correct posture. You should always have comfortably a hand's width between the end of your club and your body. So always check that with all of your clubs. Everything else is basically the same. My secret in long grass with a long iron, it's really hard to get it up in the air because it's a, such a straight face. There's a big club face it has to go through that long grass. The secret? Five wood. With the five wood you have a much smaller surface at the base. This can slide through that long grass much easier. The ball pops up higher and you have no problem holding it on the green. So try a five wood next time you get in long grass like this and watch how easy it gets out. Open the club face again, sit your stance left and break your hand sharply. And it comes out perfect. Here we have a severe downhill lie, a very difficult shot. The tendency is for the ball to slide off low and to the right. To eliminate that, aim yourself a little bit left of your target, play the ball further back in your stance, open the club face just a little bit. Now from here, most people want to slide their hip and then try to help the ball up, which means they hit it fat or slightly behind the ball. To eliminate that, make sure you break your hand sharply, follow the contour of the heel. My secret is I try to keep my lower half stationary and I'm going to break my hands sharply and follow the contour of the heel and keep the club head on the ball as long as possible. That's all there is to this. 
Let's look at it again from another angle. Place your body parallel to the downslope. The key is to remain as still as possible and stay down and through the shot. Watch how the club follows the ball. This is a severe uphill lie. The tendency with these, if you play the ball normally in your stance, is to hit into the hill. How do you stop that? All I do is play the ball further forward in my stance and I follow the contour of the hill. I'm going to go back low with the hill. It's going to shoot the ball up high. But because I've played the ball further forward in my stance, the club is going to be on the upswing of the arc. The center of the arc will be about here, so it's on the upswing. There'll be a little more release, so the ball's going to shoot left. But you will not hit into the hill. So all you do is play it further forward in your stance and aim right. And the shot is easy from there. Let's look at this one again also. Take a longer club any time you're playing uphill. Balance is very important here. Be sure to transfer your weight to the left side on the way through the shot. Follow through and finish with your hands high. Let's see how Jill's swing compares to mine on an uphill lie. The lines show that Jill's knees, hips and shoulders go against the hill as my knees, hips and shoulders go with or parallel to the lay of the land. Because of this, Jill's club head breaks away from the ground too sharply while my club follows the contour. As a result, Jill's head and upper body move up and forward at the top of her backswing while my head stays still and behind the ball. Are you having a little trouble deciding? Yes, I am. I can't decide if I should use my three iron or my five wood. Well, this is a hard situation because long irons are hard to hit. They're intimidating. You've got yeah. a, a very straight face club and it's a bigger club head. You haven't got a very good lie, so I would take yeah. the five wood because it's a little bit easier to get through the bad lie. And with fairway woods, you can swing smoothly. Okay. So let's try the five okay, wood. Okay, I'll try that. When you're having trouble deciding, always take the easier shot or the longer club. Very good. Now see how the five wood went ahead and carried a little higher yes. and stopped? Yes. The long iron would have gone in lower. Right. A ball below your feet. A very difficult fairway shot. The tendency is to fall forward on the shot. Now some people say that you should line it up on the toe so that when you fall forward you can get it into the middle of the club. The problem with that is how do you know how much you're going to fall? My secret? I sit back a little bit on my heels. Now in doing that I'm going to flex my knees and keep that position. I take a little bit extra club because I don't have the balance that I would normally have to transfer my weight. That's all you do is sit back in your stance and play the shot normally. The ball above your feet like this, tough shot. The tendency is to fall off the hill. Remember to flex your knees and keep the weight on the balls of your feet. Go down the shaft about an inch. Aim right of your target take a little bit extra club because it's hard to swing like this and swing smooth. The hazards. Intimidation of water hazards. A common problem with amateurs. The secret is to concentrate on the positive and not the negative. Don't think of what you want to avoid. Pick a certain spot and try to hit that spot. Forget the hazard is there. You play the shot as normal. I have about a 65-yard shot. I want to land the ball comfortably on the green. So I want to hit this about 10 yards on the green. Now the secret from here is not to try to help the ball over the water. Don't get anxious and look what the ball is doing. Feel confident. Pick that spot, concentrate only on that spot and not on the water. Remember, a positive thought, not a negative one. Somehow, I knew it would find its way in here. Getting into trouble spots on a golf course is just part of the game. Instead of letting your lie overwhelm you, keep one thing in mind. Your job is to get out the best possible way. The most important part of a bunker shot is the sand wedge. Every other shot in the bag, it really doesn't matter what club you use, it's personal preference, even your driver and your putter, but with a sand wedge, it has to be designed a certain way. Make sure with your sand wedge, this leading edge is lower than this back edge, 
or what's called the flange. This flange should always be higher than the leading edge because this flange is what's going to hit the sand. I have about an inch flange on this, so I am about an inch and a half behind the ball. You take whatever size your flange is and add half an inch for room for error. That's all there is to it. Now with a bunker shot, remember you're in a hazard, so you cannot ground your club. You want to get in comfortably in the sand, settle yourself, bend your knees so there'll be no movement with your legs, only a knee shock absorber type movement. You're going to open the club face so that you're going to cut the ball out and the ball's going to go in the air. Now from here, remember because you have about an inch flange, you have to aim an inch and a half behind the ball. So select a spot about an inch and a half behind the ball. Now what I'm going to do because we're practicing is draw a spot where I want my club to enter. Remember the back edge is going to enter here. Now I pick an inch and a half behind the ball, I open the club face, I set my feet, my hips and my shoulders slightly left of my target or open so that I can create a left to right cut spin. Now because you're going to come down on the spot an inch and a half behind the ball, you have to lift it up quick. So on the way back you want to take it outside the line and sharply up. You want to break your hands. Do not look at the golf ball. Look at the spot that you want to hit. You bring it up sharply and outside and hit the spot. Again, you can always check where, because I drew that line, where your club entered the sand. The two things that are great about bunkers, if you hit a touch too close to the ball, it's going to create more backspin, so the ball will stop quicker. And if you hit a little bit behind where you're aiming, it'll create a little bit of overspin. That's why you hear so many times pro say that it is actually easier out of the sand than chipping, because there's a little bit of room for error. So if you're not frightened of the sand, you'd be surprised how easy it is. Okay, Jill, remember the first thing when you're in a bunker or a hazard, you must not ground your club. That's a one-stroke penalty, so always oh, okay. keep your club just above the ground. I want you to plant your feet just a little more because you don't want to lose your balance. Okay. And you're going to break your hands a little sharper because if you do a normal swing, you're going to be coming in low and you might catch sand first. Remember, with a bunker shot, the sand wedge, this edge is going to hit first. So if you're coming in low, it might catch the ball and you'll hit it thin. So make sure that you break your hands a little sharper on the way back. Okay. Get yourself a little more planted in the sand and don't ground the club face. Oh, okay. 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 Here, let's try this again. Okay. There we go. Plant your feet. Good. Now just break your hands a little quick on the way back. There. Much. Oh, good shot. Okay, all you have to do when you hit a bunker shot is remember to aim about an inch behind the ball. What you did was, in every other golf shot, you look at the ball and you want to hit the ball first. But in uh -huh. this shot, you must hit behind the ball. So what I want you to do is pick a spot right here. I usually, when I'm practicing, draw a line so I can see if my club entered that sand okay. at that spot. So you want to pick about there. You never look at the golf ball and you hit right down that spot. So make sure you break your hands so you quickly. And with the club, try to hit there. Okay, so you spot that instead of the ball. Exactly. Okay. okay. Okay? You never want to try and pick it out of the sand. You always hit down because it's almost like a shovel effect. Uh -huh. This hits the sand first, and then it goes underneath the ball. And the ball, this throws it up like a little shovel. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, with the bunker shot, remember, I'm going to draw a line about two inches behind the ball where I want my club to enter the sand. This is just for practice. Do not do this in the tournament because you're not allowed to ground your club in a hazard. Remember that. Open the club face, which means that this is square, so I'm going to open the club face and then re-grip it again. Do not start with it square and then try to open it up and keep that grip. Make sure you open the club face and then re-grip it the way we've already discussed in gripping. Now that you have the club face open, make sure that your body is open, which means that you're feet, your hips and your shoulders are aimed left of your target for two reasons. One, to get your body out of the way so you can hit the shot, and two is to create a left to right spin on the ball. Okay, after we've set up for an open stance, we're going to break our hands very sharply and come down the spot that we're aiming at. So you're going to break your hands and take it outside the line and hit the spot. That's all you do. You do not ever look at the golf ball in the bunker. Look at that spot that you want to hit. Remember to plant your feet. Everything is open. You're going to take it up sharply and hit behind the ball where you're aiming at. Now, you can see after you've hit the shot when you're practicing that you can check to see that the club actually entered the sand where you had it aimed, and that was the back flange edge. Now, the great thing about bunkers is that it's much more forgiving than a chip shot. If you hit it a touch too 
thin or close to the ball, the ball will actually have more backspin, so it'll save you. And the other way, if you hit a touch behind where you're aiming, it will have a little bit of overspin. That's why you hear so many pros say that it is actually easier in the bunker than chipping. Pitching and chipping. Short range pitching is an art in itself. With this shot, I think the most important thing to remember is to pick the right club. I have about a 50 foot chip shot right here. And the thing that's important is every shot you play is the same. It's just what club. You have to pick a club that's going to carry safely onto the green. So I want to pick something that's going to hit six feet on the green and then go ahead and run to the hole. Remember with pitching, select a club that will carry you safely onto the green and then run the rest of the way to the hole. For example, I hit a six iron. If I'm close to the green, I just have to carry it six feet on the green and run. Or an eight iron, or a pitching wedge as I am now. The reason you don't pitch the shot into the air is that it's much easier to judge something, for example, if you rolled it to the hole rather than had to throw it and carry it and then judge what it would do. So that's why all pros always pitch and run the shot. Now I have a pitching wedge right now and I want to hit it about six feet on the green and then hit it to the hole, let it run. It'll do the rest itself. Now how do you swing with this way? All you do, every swing is the same. You take it slightly inside the line on the way back my stance and my hips are slightly open, or a little bit left of the target, so that there's no restriction, so I can go through to the hole. I take it slightly on the inside back. I feel like my right knee just kicks in a little so that I don't stop and hit the shot fat. And that's what I see a lot of amateurs doing. They stand too flat-footed, and then they try to help it. You want to just kick it a little bit with your right foot to get yourself moving forward. Keep your hands ahead. Now, I try to hold this position here. I do not want the club to turn over and have it, give it some overspin. I want to keep control of the club. So what I do is I take it slightly on the inside and the way back, so just a touch inside, and I come through to the hole and hold the shot. So all it is is you take it inside and hold the shot. Keep your hands ahead. It's going to hit the green and roll on. That's all there is to it. Okay, see how you hit a little bit behind that ball? It's because okay. your hands were a little bit behind the ball. Now, if you keep your hands ahead, that way you'd catch the ball first, oh, okay. and it would keep the overspin. And I would like you to go down the shaft. It's a little bit on the grip so that you have more control. You want to have the shot spinning off with overspin rather than sometimes it, it gets, has a backswing. So make sure you go down the shaft, keep okay. the club face square. Okay, I'll try that. Okay. Yes, and see how that turns over? Yeah. That's much better. Yeah. Remember, select the club that can comfortably carry you onto the green and then roll to the hole. Aim your feet and your hips slightly left of your target, which is what's called open. Take it slightly inside and the way back. Hold your follow through so that the club stays straight at the hole. Remember, the more you can concentrate on this part of the game, the better it's going to be for your game. Putting. Putting, the most important part of the game. Let's start with the grip. This is the first time you're going to change the grip. This is what's called a right hand putting grip. And if you're right hand, this is what you should do. You should hold on mostly with your right hand. The only reason your left hand is on is to guide the putter. It doesn't do any of the actual stroke. In fact, you can putt as well with your right hand as with both hands. And if you practice this, you'll be surprised how well you can putt. You can make sure that you do keep your right hand in there and that your left hand is just on to keep a little bit of a guideline. You'll be surprised how well you can putt with your right hand. You'll see often pros practice this way to make sure that their right hand is in play. Now the right hand goes on there with the, left, the right thumb straight down the shaft. And now all you do is slide the left thumb underneath the right pad of your thumb and I, try, I always try to feel like my left finger and my wrist are one piece all the way down. Now that we have the correct grip, let's go to ball position. Line the club up first. When you take your stance, the ball should be slightly forward of the center of your stance. The reason you do this is so that your hands are about the center of your thigh, your left thigh, 
And when you take it back, because you're coming on the upswing, you're going to create overspin. Sometimes you'll see professionals, their balls go towards the hole, and once they hit the cup, they dive in. And it seems like a lot of amateurs, when their ball hits the cup, it goes the other way because they're putting backspin on the ball from having it too far back in their stance. If you have it forward in your stance, then you create an overspin that's coming up, and once it hits something, it will dive towards it. So when it hits the hole, it'll go in, hopefully. Let's try that. Now that you have everything ahead, you keep your hands ahead. Now the two most important things after that, keeping your head still. This is one time when you do keep your head down and still because your body and your shoulders are swinging around your head and it's very important. In fact, to check that, your eyes should be over the ball. Now they don't have to be directly over the ball as long as they're on the line that the ball is on. The way to check that is when you get yourself ready, you can take a coin or something right between your eyes or a golf ball and drop it and it should drop right behind that line. Now you keep your head there at all times and you swing around that. Now there's a new theory on putting. The old putting theory used to be wristy and the amateurs still do that. 95% of the professionals do not because when you're putting with your wrists, it's what's called breaking down, which means that the putter passes your hands before or at impact. Now, when you do that, it's too hard to control. Once we have the correct ball position and your head is still, now we can go on to stroke. There are two theories on stroke, wrist putting and what's called shoulder putting. Wrist putting is very old-fashioned and none of the professionals use it anymore. So obviously it doesn't work very well. The reason being is that it's called breaking down, which means your club head passes your wrists before it gets to impact and that's too hard to control and repeat every time. When you're under pressure, if you break your wrists, like I'm going to demonstrate now, it can go left or right and it's very difficult to judge speed. Speed is very important in putting. So the way the professionals do it is they lock their wrists. The way I do it, I try to get a line down from my left forearm all the way down. And I even make carry it through onto my left forefinger. And a lot of professionals do this. That line should never break. Now you can create a little angle here with your right arm or your right wrist, which also helps. Now I, all I do from there is lock everything. I keep my head still and I putt with my forearms. The only thing that moves are my forearms. That creates overspin and the ball, hmm, <laughs> and the ball goes straight in the hole. Now remember, do not let the club head pass your hands before or at impact. That is the most important thing. And now all you have to do from here is accelerate. Keep your forearms together and accelerate. You know, there's very little instruction on putting, and it's really the big difference between an amateur and a professional. The amateurs break down and are wrist putters, and that's very bad, especially under pressure. So keep your forearms locked, and then just swing from there. Now, with acceleration, I always feel like I try to make sure that every putt accelerates the same. A putt should go 14 inches past the hole. Now that we have the perfect stroke, all we have to concentrate now is speed. Now how you judge your speed is that they should have acceleration. So I always take it back so that my acceleration is the same every time with every putt. And the way you do that is all you do is control it with your backswing and your backstroke. Your speed is controlled by how far you take it back. Your acceleration is the same every time. I see so many people with a long putt take it back the same distance and try to help it and with a short putt they take it back too far and decelerate. The most important thing is the acceleration must be the same every time. The next step is learning to read the break. This takes a lot of imagination and practice. First of all I imagine running water to determine which way it's going to break. Then I go to that low side and see how much it's going to break. If you go to the high side it diminishes the perspective of how much it's going to break. Then I get down low to the ball and I see my line. I try to imagine every putt going 12 inches by the hole. If you try to get the ball to die into the hole, it breaks too much. So try to keep your putts uniform. This putt looks like it breaks about an inch and a half left to right. So I'm going to pick a spot somewhere up near the hole that's about an inch left of my hole. Here, I'm going to pick at this piece of grass. I'm going to aim there. I'm going to try to roll the ball 12 inches by that spot. Now from there, you do not focus again on the hole. You keep looking at that spot. 
If you look at the hole, you will push your shot to the hole. So keep looking at that piece of grass or anything that you've picked to aim at. But do not look at the hole. Let's let Hisako putt one. Okay, that's a good stroke. Two things that I think you should do is don't lock your elbows so tight because it's too hard. To, this is a feel shot. So relax your elbows just a little bit. Bend them a little bit. And if you're still too far away from the ball, then bend your knees and bend over a little more. But make sure these are a little bit relaxed. Uh -huh. And you, because you're holding on so tight, you're pressing down into the grass. This is a very common uh -huh. problem. It, it happens with a lot of amateurs because they get so scared and so nervous and they hold on firmly with a lot of shots. That's but when fine. you're putting, actually, I try to hold the putter just off the grass a little bit because oh, okay. when it gets down in the grass the first movement is almost jerky trying to get it out so just hold it lightly Jack Nicholas does this he never grounds the putter he holds it just above the grass so that you have actually have it held in your hands oh, okay. okay now you need to bend over more this way yes that's it okay keep the putter above the grass that's good see how it doesn't have that jerky feeling back oh, and don't ever have a death grip because this is where a touch is very important. So you need okay. to have a nice, light, but still firm mm -hmm. hold of the club. Okay. Okay? Okay. Let's go over this one more time. Hold the putter with your right hand. Slide the left in just for guidelines. Set your head over the ball and keep it very still. Set your stance slightly ahead of center of the stance with, for the ball. Keep your hands ahead. You're going to lock your wrists and putt with your forearms and accelerate through the ball. Remember, you control your acceleration and your speed with the length of your backswing. Keep your head very still. Do not break your wrists. Okay, now that we've learned the basics, let's put it all together and play golf. I've asked my caddy Rick to join us. What do we have here? 370 yard elevated right to left par four. Pins on the left 10, it's not bunkered. It's 200 yards to carry that bunker on the right. Okay, so I can still carry it even though it's uphill? Correct. And I don't need to hit left to right? No, I hit it right to left. Okay. Even though it's uphill, I think I can carry it right to left, you think? Yeah. Okay, now don't forget to tee it up a little bit higher because you're going uphill. And remember to extend back more and kick your right foot in and stay with it. Oh, it's going left of where I wanted it to go. I obviously didn't kick my right foot in fast enough. I decided to come in from the left side. <laughs> With Jill, her left foot is moving too much right before she takes it back. She has a good backswing, but her head is still down at a follow through. Jane does not have enough weight transfer and she's falling back on her follow through. Hisako is too flat footed. She does not have enough weight going onto her right side and again this has no power. This is a par 4, 358 yards uphill. There's a fairway bunker over to the right with about a 210 yard carry from the tee. Jill drove hers 180 yards and has 178 left. Jane drove hers 140 yards and has 218 left to the pin. Hisako drove hers 158 yards and has 200 yards left to the hole. I drove mine 240 yards and I have 118 yards left to the pin. Jill is leaning too much into the uphill slope here and it's causing her ball to go to the right. Hisako is too concerned with the uphill slope. She's trying to help the ball up the hill. Her ball is going too low. Did you see what the balls were doing? Were anybody's balls bouncing? Yeah, they bounced about five yards to the left. So we want to okay. fly this ball about five short and five right. Okay. I'm a little bit uphill right here, so... Was it almost a club uphill, do you think? Yeah, about eight to ten yards. Okay, and I'm... Uphill side hill, so the ball's going to move about five yards right to left off this lie. So I need to aim a touch right. If I aim it just on that right edge, the left edge of that bunker, is that going to be the right one? That's perfect. Line? That okay. is perfect. What's that window yeah, up there? You have a little cross breeze left to right, and you have 110 to the front and 118 to the pin. 
Okay, so I need to, for one club uphill, a nine should get me there, huh? I think it's perfect. Should carry with about a five yards run? Right. Okay. I need to birdie this hole. A short hole like this. Driven it in perfect position. Don't forget, follow the contour of the hill. Take it back slow and lower than normal. That's the right line. Let's see if it gets the right bounce. Oh! Great bounce. <laughs> Tournament bounce there. Jane has 90 yards left to the hole. Hisako has 80, and Jill has 60 yards. Jane's backswing is a little long for this shot. It's a common problem, and it's causing a deceleration. Hisako does not transfer enough weight on her backswing, and she's leaning into the hill a little bit too much on her follow-through. But she hit a great shot. Good shot. Jill makes a good swing, and she's hit a good shot. I can't believe that shot bounced that much left. I thought I hit it close. I did too. It bounced more than I thought it would. Yeah. That's a lot more severe heel there than it looks, too. I need this putt. Check that grain out the hole. Which way is it going? It's coming off this mound, west, this way. The heel really comes into play right about here, that last six feet. How much break do you see from there? Eight inches enough? I don't think so, Jan. I think you need a foot here. No, I think you're right. It is going to come off that hill right there. And it'll die much more if it's coming at the right speed. Yeah, totally speed pot. All right, we need a, I think I'll just go ahead and play the 12. I need this putt, because I was counting on a birdie on the short hole. Now, let's see, what can I aim at about 12 inches left? Oh, good, there's a little divot mark. I'll aim right at there. Now, I'm going to have to do this a touch softer to let it die into the hole for that break. Go. Ah, oh, get in. Right. <laughs> Hisako makes a tough putt. Now, Jane needs this for her two putt. And Jill needs this one to two putt also. Thanks, that was Thank a lot of fun. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Great shot. Thanks, Zaka. You know, a great thing about golf, you don't need the cheers of the crowd for it to be fun, and you don't have to be at the same ability to enjoy the camaraderie and the challenge of the game. I enjoyed sharing my love of the game with you. Remember, keep practicing, keep playing, and good luck. Jan Stevenson and thanks for joining me. You know, anybody can really enjoy golf, whether your style is power or finesse and accuracy. So today we're going to use these and other principles to sharpen your game. We'll be working with three women, Jane Higginson, Jill Devine and Hisako Mura. Their styles and levels of play vary, which gives us a good opportunity to improve their game as well as yours. As we move through each phase of this videotape, the segment titles are written on the screen and a different color background appears. This way, later when you want to work on a specific area or brush up, which believe me is often, just fast forward or push the search button to locate the appropriate segment and corresponding color. There are seven segments covered. The color codes for each section are as follows. First, club selection will be white. Second, warm up will be yellow. Third, the tee shot will be green. Fourth, the fairway shot will be turquoise. Fifth, the hazards will be red. Sixth, pitching and chipping will be lilac, and seventh, putting will be pink. Like any sport, you want proper equipment, so we'll start by selecting clubs that are comfortable and the right ball. Then we'll warm up before tackling that first tee. Work on your grip, stance, and swing, plus cover which clubs to use off the tee. And then, depending on where you land in the fairway, you'll learn to handle the middle woods and irons. And just when you think you can't hit a bad shot, up jumps the devil. The hazards, bunkers, water, the rough, and sand traps. These I know well. Then we'll cover the short irons for pitching and chipping. And finally, putting. This is where you can really shave strokes off your game. Club selection. 
Decisions, decisions. Whether you go to a pro shop at a golf course or a sporting goods store, you'll find excellent equipment tailored to your game. Here are some tips on club selection. When having your clubs measured for your true custom fit, be sure you're measured from your fingertips to the ground and not according to your height. For men, swing weight should be somewhere around D0 and for women, somewhere between C2 and C6. A man six foot tall should have a standard lion loft and a woman, let's say five foot five, should have about a two degrees flat and a standard loft. Another important consideration in determining the selection of equipment is choosing the right grip size. If a woman